Let's talk about weed control methods in the landscape. We've talked about identifying landscape weeds, classifying them so we can know how to control them properly, understanding maybe some identification of invasive species and how an invasive species could be different from uh, a standard landscape weed, as well as the weedy characteristics of those landscape weeds. So now let's talk about how to control them. Some of the strategies for removing weeds, primarily in a landscape horticultural setting. This is different than kind of an agricultural setting or even a nursery setting. We're focusing on the landscape here with our control methods. And we're going to move up the pyramid of control methods, focusing first on prevention and then mentioning the less potentially harmful methods, and finally focusing on chemical control. Now I'm going to present these in a certain order, and we have this handy little pyramid that kind of uh, indicates a hierarchy, but I want you to remember that this is general recommendations. Every specific context may suggest a alternate appropriate method. So uh, many folks are quick to discount chemical control. They will be interested in eliminating all synthetic chemicals from a garden and garden the organic way. I am a proponent of doing that. However, I do recognize a few instances where Perhaps the chemical control is the least harmful for removing a problematic plant, not just in our landscapes, but even in our wild ecosystems. So uh, one example would be if we had a massive plant that was growing in a natural ecosystem, and that plant is not contributing to the ecosystem, and in fact, it's out competing and hurting the natural ecosystem. It is perhaps contributing to fire risk or even uh, potentially increased erosion. One thing to do would be to remove this plant by hand, mechanically. However, if it's really big, you need equipment to do that. You need machines to come in and bulldoze down the plant. And in order to get the machine in there, you need to make a road. And so what if it's not very accessible and you're committed to removing this plant for the benefit of the environment, but the methods available end up causing a great deal of harm in and of themselves. Now contrast that to a chemical. In this case, we'll call it an herbicide. You either cut down the tree and take a paintbrush and apply a little bit of herbicide to the plant, or even a drill into a tree, and you can inject the herbicide right inside the tree, guaranteeing that that tree will die. And now there's no need for the road, the bulldozer, the machines, the people power, all that kind of stuff. So when we're looking at managing weeds, we have to think in a broader context. It's more complex than good or bad, right and wrong. And we're trying to get the most benefit with the least harm in all circumstances. So here we go with our lecture on weed control methods. And remember, here is our pyramid. It's the general integrated pest management approach. We're trying to focus on the bottom of the pyramid first always focusing on prevention. And then as we look at different control methods, we're trying to use the least toxic as well as those that contribute to the most preventative control. Oftentimes cultural control, uh, how we operate with the landscape can prevent weeds. The physical mechanical control is how we choose to remove those weeds. Sometimes it's as simple as pulling the weeds by hand, biological control, looking at uh, plant competition, preventing weeds that way. Finally, chemical control. 
And even within chemical control, we have least toxic methods and we have what you could call more conventional pesticides. We'll get into the specifics of that as we go along. So let's begin with some prevention. And you can see on the bottom, we will move up the pyramid as we go. When we work on weed prevention in the landscape, we're thinking about how we will prepare the site, if we're ever going to redesign the landscape. We want to focus on avoiding new introductions, and we always want to encourage desirable plants. Let's take a look at these in greater detail. We'll start with site preparation. And how you cultivate the soil is important in advance of planting. When you till the soil, cultivate the soil, or bring in topsoil for a landscape construction, you have the opportunity to unearth or bring up new weed seeds. So typically, we want to do this as little as possible. And when we do this, we want to be thinking about um, how we can manage any new weed seeds before we get the landscape totally installed and ready to be uh, turned over to those who manage it. And so there's various strategies we will employ, um, making sure we use clean material, uh, being conscious of how often we till that top layer. Many times, if you do need to cultivate in preparation of planting, uh, you would allow some weeds to grow, come back, remove them, maybe do that two or three times, and then get your plants established. And we, in general, want to cover the soil as quickly as possible to prevent those weed seeds from germinating. Open, exposed soil is soil that is susceptible to weeds. One strategy that goes hand in hand with cultivation is solarization. And this is simply using the heat of the sun to kill weed plants. This is done in agricultural settings by rolling out large tarps. If you roll out a black tarp, it's going to uh, heat up. If you roll out a clear tarp, it's going to let that light go through and turn into a little greenhouse. Both types of tarps can be successful depending on the climate of the region and what season you're in. And we can see that solarization is even used as a restoration tool one example here for San Diego County is on our coastal salt marsh. We have uh, a relatively recent introduction, the Algerian sea lavender, that is existing and growing in the same niche as the native sea lavender. And you can see a group of volunteers out there pulling the sea lavender. And there's some research that suggests solarization can be an effective strategy as well. When you do solarization, you want to be careful of the timing. If you're rolling out the mat on top of other plants, you want to do so at a time that's going to impact your target organism and not do damage to any non-target organisms. So careful consideration of the life cycle and the timing of that species becomes very valuable. Another common way to prevent weeds during site preparation is with some type of sheet mulch. And this is a method that is outlined in our course text as well. It's quite popular among home gardeners, kind of the sustainability and permaculture movements typically uh, promote lasagna mulch or sheet mulch of some type. Very simply, sheet mulch is a thick layer of material that's laid down over the soil in order to prevent weeds and to hold in moisture. Many times, people will uh, mix a variety of materials, and some of those materials are tougher than others. For example, cardboard or newspaper, sometimes even old bed sheets, cloth or cotton fabric can even be used. A commercial equivalent would be the landscape fabric that contractors really like to put down when they're installing gravel beds or landscapes with mulch. Now, all of these in general, I would recommend 
trying to avoid. Mulch is great. Organic material laid on top of the surface of the soil is excellent. And I encourage you to apply mulch virtually everywhere and do so in a thick layer of four to six inches. However, when we create these more permanent barriers, it'll take several years for them to break down. We have many potential dangers. And so unless it's done completely appropriately, there's a chance for more harm than good. The cardboard and the newspaper in a dry climate like San Diego, it can tend to become dehydrated once it's applied. And then the problem is any overhead irrigation or rainfall, instead of percolating through the wet cardboard, will run off horizontally. You'll actually prevent the infiltration of water. In order to uh, use cardboard and newspaper appropriately in Southern California, you would need to thoroughly saturate that material and make sure it stays wet with a thick layer of organic material on top. And because of that risk, I tend to recommend to leave the cardboard out. Yes, you'll have a few more weeds pop up, but you won't have to worry about that extra uh, layer of cardboard staying wet. It's easy to pull the weeds, especially when you have a thick layer of mulch on top. So sheet mulch is a special type of application of mulch, and it's one that uh, in general, we can try to avoid unless it's absolutely necessary. The same goes for the commercial landscape fabric, the weed cloth, the weed barrier that is often rolled down underneath mulch in a landscape installation. That looks great for two years and then it breaks down. It breaks apart and there's fibers mixed with plastic in that material. And whoever's in charge of keeping that landscape going into the future is gonna have quite a problem if they have to deal with the landscape fabric. So I encourage people not to install landscapes with landscape fabric as a weed prevention or a weed barrier. Why is it still sold and why is it commonly done if it is such a problem two years later? Well, because the people who install it, they want it to look good for two years so they can move on to new customers, new projects, and oftentimes those folks are not the same people who are maintaining the landscape long term. There may be a few exceptions where some barrier is appropriate, but in general, I would recommend leaving that out entirely and then just have other design considerations trying to minimize your weeds. Next, we will look at redesigning a landscape uh, as a form of weed prevention. Oftentimes now we see folks are removing the front lawn in a suburban residential place and replacing them with more drought tolerant shrubs. This is a great thing to do because it's more in line with our natural habitat, the natural climate of San Diego. And you can even incorporate a lot of native plants and bring in some wildlife value as well. When we do this, we wanna be careful on our plant selection. We want to select plants that do not have those weedy characteristics. It would be a shame for us to be redesigning a landscape and then giving the customers some problems into the future. And even if they're not classified as an invasive species, we want to think very carefully about those plants that tend to become weedy or have the characteristics of weeds where they will grow rapidly and pop up and outcompete. And we want to try to avoid even those plant selections. Another thing to consider is the spacing. And in general, the closer the spacing, the less room for weeds. So it doesn't mean you need to cover every square inch of soil. But it does mean that in general, when you're redesigning a landscape, we want it to look very full and lush. Almost imagine a miniature forest canopy, and then it will actually be acting the way our native shrublands behave. And there, there's very little weed pressure 
in those types of dense plantings. Similarly, when we are redesigning hardscape, it's worth it to give consideration to the landscape weeds that may be encouraged or discouraged by what we design. The photo on the left shows a concrete mow curb as a barrier between a turfed area and a mulched shrub bed. This is typically a pretty good thing to put into the landscape. It may be a little bit more costly, but it's a much higher quality. First of all, it looks nicer, but secondly, it's more permanent and will discourage weeds into the future. This is in contrast to what a lot of people end up doing which is they'll take cobblestones or hand-sized stones and just line them up in a row, trying to delineate some kind of a shrub bed. And that look can be quite nice, kind of has a cottage or a rustic type of a look. However, the loose stones are going to be attractors for weeds. What do you have under a rock? You tend to have cool shaded soil, that holds more moisture. It's also where all the bugs and living things go is under the rocks. And so you'll have a bit more organic matter actually under those stones. Stones can be a great thing to incorporate into the landscape, but if you make a barrier out of them, a single line, without having intentional plants very close to that, that is going to be a place where you will always have weeds popping up through the cracks of the stones. And in this case, the image on the left-hand side, a solid mow curb would provide fewer weeds. Similarly, let's look at the image on the right-hand side. Nowadays, a lot of people opt for landscape pavers in place of permanently poured cement or sidewalk. And there's a lot of good benefits for using landscape pavers. They're less permanent. You can easily move them or change them into the future. They look nice because you can have interesting patterns and their reusable nature generally makes them a little bit more sustainable of a product. And one of the general benefits of pavers is that they're permeable and they allow rainwater and excess water to infiltrate down into the soil. Now that infiltration of water will also allow weed seeds to become established and provide a little reservoir of water for those weeds. So I'm not telling you not to put in pavers because in general, I think they're a great addition to many landscapes. However, it's important when you do design with a paver walkway or patio that you make some consideration for future weed pressure so that we don't give our clients a problem that they have to live with into the future. Still on prevention, we can go a long way to avoid new introductions. Introductions of weeds can be brought in on nursery stock when you're installing landscapes or putting new plants in the ground, as you can see on the upper image. When we bring in soil amendments, uh, if you dispose of weeds in a landscape, the neighboring site, they all can be places where new weeds are brought in. Additionally, the landscape maintenance equipment, the mowers, the trimmers, the trucks, and even the clothing of the people who go from landscape to landscape, now they have the potential to introduce new weeds. It's a great habit to practice good hygiene, clean off your equipment and your clothing after maintaining a landscape and before going on to the next one. And excluding invasive plants is generally um, an important thing to do. The image on the bottom shows hydro mulch. Many times this is also referred to as hydro seed because in the mulch are seeds. So this is a person applying a hydro seed mix and there is an additional color so that the applicator can see where it has been applied and where it hasn't. So what is this? It's water mixed with typically like straw, uh, an organic based material, and turned into some form of a slurry that will stick to a hillside in order to prevent erosion. And oftentimes native plant seeds are incorporated into the hydro mulch 
as a form of restoration. This method works very well. It's very economical. It doesn't cost very much and you get a lot of plants in a difficult to landscape area. However, if the seed applied to the hydro mulch contains some weed seeds, then there will be a lot of weeding to be done in the early days. A landscape like this needs to be very intensively weeded for the first year, almost on your hands and knees to pull out the landscape weeds and encourage those little seedlings that are proper or intended in the seed mix. And if you can commit to doing that, you will almost certainly have a successful restoration. Without that initial monitoring for weeds, it'll be very difficult uh, for the intended plants to outcompete any new introductions. Next, let's take a step up the IPM pyramid and look at cultural control. Here, our primary method is applying mulch. And remember, I recommend mulch in a four to six inch layer. Anything can be mulch. You can use wood chips or landscape trimmings as mulch. Typically, that's what we think of. It can be the thing you buy in a bag that has some colorant or dye added to it. In general, I recommend uh, just the standard arborist prunings a mix of green leafy material along with the wood chips. And that provides a pretty good balanced mix. It breaks down over time, adds fertility, but those wood chips will persist. Now you always add the mulch on the surface of the soil only. Don't incorporate it down below where the roots of the plants are. This is something kind of like a blanket. We wanna keep in the moisture and keep out the sun from the soil we're preventing evaporation. Additionally, we will have some weed suppression. However, there will always be weeds that grow through mulch. So don't put down mulch and think you never have to pull the weeds, you do. But when you do have a nice thick layer of mulch, the weeds that you do need to remove are much easier to pull. And so it's not about trying to prevent 100%, it just means you'll have fewer weeds and those that you do have are much easier to remove from the landscape. Other things can act as mulch, including gravel, stones, even crushed up tires and rubber. And those may have appropriate applications. However, I would recommend you try to only arrive at those solutions as a last resort or as a totally appropriate for context type of a decision. In general, your standard go-to arborist chippings are the best thing to use as mulch. Many times they're available for free or for a very affordable price. It's easy to spread, it adds fertility over time, and it does suppress the weeds to an extent. You also want to look at how you irrigate. So we can compare and contrast these two images. Certainly the image on the left with drip irrigation, only applying the water to the plant that's intended is going to have fewer weeds than the large image in the middle that shows massive overspray. All that extra water is going to probably grow some extra weeds. And so a good cultural control method is to rein in that irrigation, prevent any overspray, and consider drip irrigation, micro spray emitters, or a more targeted approach for irrigating the landscape. This even includes subsurface irrigation options. Regardless of what irrigation method is used, it's important to try to only put the water to where it is intended and only irrigate the intended plant as much as necessary for it to be healthy. Now let's look one more step up the pyramid at mechanical control. This becomes a little bit more intensive, takes more energy, time, effort, and it's better to have prevented the weeds in the first place, but you're still gonna have some. And so here are some methods for mechanically removing the weeds. 
First of all, there's good old fashioned hand pulling. Get out those gloves and get on your knees and rip the plant out of the ground. And there are many different types of tools that can be used to assist with removing weeds by hand, uh, including trowels and uh, little dandelion forks, things like that. And different circumstances are, some are easier than others. One thing in general you want to try to do when pulling weeds by hand is try your best to get the roots out of the soil. Many times if you come along and only remove the leaves, something like a dandelion we can see there with very deep tap root is going to persist and will be back again. And so if you really want to eliminate the weeds in general, pulling weeds means pulling the roots as well out of the soil. And then uh, we've got some hand tools we can use. The standard tool for pulling weeds is a hoe. Hoeing is a way to eliminate weeds and there's many different types. One of the most popular in a landscape setting is the stirrup hoe or the oscillating hoe. That's the image on the left-hand side. Many times people call it the hula hoe because it kind of rocks back and forth Hulaho is one common brand name for a certain type of stirrup hoe. They cut on the forward and the backward, and you have a lot of control with how deep the blade goes so that you're only slicing young weeds at the surface and you're not pulling up new ones from down below. If you're going to be doing a lot of that, especially in row crop settings like a small farm, you can get that same type of hoe with a wheel. And the image on the top in the middle shows that. It's much easier to use the wheeled hoe. And it really works best in straight lines or areas where you have uh, regular weeds that need to be controlled frequently and not too difficult of an area. Finally, the tool down at the bottom is one that uh, is a bit hefty for many residential gardeners. However, in restoration, it's a great tool. It's uh, commonly referred to as the McLeod. It's very common with the uh, wildland firefighters for clearing uh, fire breaks and uh, all types of plant material, including woody shrubs and branches can be chopped down with the McLeod. And just like a a standard rake or hoe, it has the tines on one side, it has the flat edge on the other. It's great for removing those larger or more pesky plants, still with mechanical means, and you can do a lot of work with it. This is a tool that I would recommend a professional to go out and purchase. A homeowner would typically not be uh, benefiting from a McLeod go and get yourself a hula hoe and you will do just fine. There are machines, including mowers and string trimmers. Your standard lawn mower can be just fine at removing and even preventing weeds. Uh, if you think about it, we wanna stop that weed from growing and spreading seeds. So we can come along at the right time and chop it down before the flowers get pollinated and turn into seeds. And if we do that timing very carefully, sometimes it might take two or three passes in a season, but we can effectively prevent that plant from passing on its seeds into future generations. And there are larger, more industrial forms of these equipments. Uh, for example, the sidebar mower that you see attached to the tractor in the image on the left-hand side. This is very popular for ma maintaining roadways, keeping weeds and grasses from growing too tall on the sides of the road so that uh, visually cars have a safer time of navigating the turns. But this also helps to keep the, weed, the weeds down and prevent uh, woody shrubs from establishing in an area. You can see the workers on the right hand side using the standard string trimmer or the weed whacker in order to remove all sorts of uh, different types of weeds in the landscape. It looks like we've got some wild mustard and some oat grass and a few other things common to San Diego County. 
And these workers are knocking down the weeds to prevent the spread of their seeds. And just this effort alone is enough to reduce the amount of weed spread and encourage restoration or the native plants that are nearby. And then we start to get even more and more intense with our methodologies. We can use flames and heat to kill the weeds. So uh, kind of fun to imagine walking around with a flamethrower and using that to kill or burn the weeds growing through the cracks in the sidewalk. Now, this is great because it's not using chemicals. It's not having a lasting impact on the soil. Uh, but you do want to use some caution. Of course, there will be some effect. First of all, that flame needs to be created with some kind of gas or fuel, often propane. And secondly, we want to be careful. We don't want to burn ourselves or hurt any unintended plants in the landscape. And we certainly don't want to cause a wildfire, which is very easy to do in California. So in the right place at the right time, you may find that flames, torches, weed heaters do a good job of eliminating weed seeds in the soil. A similar method, but not using fire, instead involves using water, hot water or steam. So there are commercial steam applicators that can be used to kill weeds in the landscape, especially those in the urban setting that grow through the cracks in the sidewalk. And steam is really nice because you get the heat damage from the hot water, but there's no chance that you can start a fire with steam. And there's nothing that persists in the soil. And some homeowners will even take an electric tea kettle, go outside and pour that boiling water onto the plants growing through the cracks in the sidewalk. And there you go, a nice simple little way to keep the weeds down. In fact, the image on the bottom shows a simple little trial. These are the results of a simple trial where somebody applied boiling water to the weeds on the left-hand side. That looks like uh, crabgrass. Uh, in the middle, they applied vinegar. And on the right hand side, they applied vinegar and salt. You may read on the internet that salt is a good thing to put in the soil to keep the weeds down. And they're not wrong, but never put salt in your soil. We already have salt in our soil, especially the sodium salts, and we don't want any more of it in San Diego. And so we're alkaline as it is, and adding more salt will increase the alkalinity and sodium-based salts are toxic to plants. That's why they work on weeds, because they kill plants. And the salt persists. It doesn't really go away. It takes a lot of water to flush the salt deeper into the soil. And you're, there's better ways to prevent weeds than by salting the earth. And so please don't put salt in your soil. Vinegar is uh, a better solution if you are going to apply anything, but vinegar is chemical control. And so before you go to the route of chemical control, maybe consider some boiling water in your application and see if that does just as good. Now let's talk about herbicides. And in doing so, I'm going to describe them in some general categories so that you have a better understanding of what they are and how they work. It's important when we talk about herbicides to try to set aside any judgments that we may be bringing to the table. Either we love the herbicides or we hate the herbicides. And I want you to approach this conversation with curiosity and a neutral attitude. And then you can just think about them in a way that is appropriate for a certain context. And even if I would recommend not to use herbicides in any given context, it's important to know about them so we can make sure we help educate others in how to use them properly or at least not cause any undue harm. So when herbicides are applied to the landscape, simply it's any chemical that is meant to kill plants. Herbicide. It's a subcategory of a pesticide and a weed is a specific type of pest. 
So when we're applying chemicals to the landscape, we want to be targeting only the specific weed and not harming anything else now or into the future. So this includes uh, the opportunities for the herbicide to go down into the soil, to persist in the soil, to make its way to groundwater, to come in contact with humans or other animals, or even our landscape plants. We don't want to do that. And so understanding how herbicides work is very important so we can prevent that from happening in the landscape. And only those rare times when we do need to use the herbicides should we do so. And we need to do so with proper care and attention. So we need to pay attention to the active ingredient of the chemical, not just what it's called in the store, but what's the actual active ingredient and what is it doing? We need to pay attention to the formulation, which is how is it made available? It's the ingredient that's active, but that ingredient is coming in a certain form. Is it a liquid? Is it a granular? Is it some other kind of formulation? We need to pay attention to the application timing. We need to do so at the right time of the year so that it will be taken in properly by the target plant. And we need to make sure we're not doing it before or after any uh, rain that will probably wash it into the environment. And we need to be thinking about many other things, especially in urban settings, close to schools and other places like that. You want to think about the mode of action. So this is related to the active ingredient. That active ingredient is going to do something specifically to the plant that you're targeting. It will prevent it from reproducing. It will prevent the seeds from germinating. It will go down and kill the roots, or it will get itself into the plant in one form or another. So that is called the mode of action. And we want to, we need to know what that mode of action is so we can be paying careful attention to the proper use of herbicide. And we want to think about blends whether we're mixing multiple active ingredients, various mixtures in the formulation, and potentially multiple modes of action. So let's talk about some general types of herbicides, and I'm gonna present them in either or category. Now it's important to know that these are all unique categories, so every herbicide can be categorized in one of these two ways, in multiple ways. Let's take a look. An herbicide can either be a pre-emergent or a post-emergent. Pre-emergent is an herbicide that you put down in the landscape before the seed sprouts. And this is a way to prevent the weed from getting established. That's different than post-emergence, which is after the weed pops up, a different type of herbicide would be used to control or kill that plant after it emerges. Any of your herbicides are going to be either pre-emergent or post-emergent. Contact or systemic. Now, contact is a type of mode of action in an herbicide, when the chemical touches the plant, you have contact and then you begin to have control. It works when the chemical touches the plant. Systemic herbicides are those that make their way into, inside, usually the vascular system of the plant as a way to control it. And so there would be less exterior contact, less chance for it to be hurting the non-target organism. However, it would be self-contained inside of the plant in question. There's selective or broad spectrum. Selective herbicides 
will target a very specific type of plant. For example, grasses only, or broadleafs only, or even sedge only, which is a certain kind of a monocot. Or you could have a broad spectrum herbicide, and that's much more like anything it touches, it kills if it's a plant. Finally, the synthetic or the organic. Synthetic is something that's made by people, often in a laboratory. Organic is something that is naturally derived. And many people will think that organic is better than synthetic. And many times that's true, but not all of the time. In some cases, a chemical that is derived from natural methods may have some variation in its strength because in nature, different concentrations of naturally occurring chemicals can be found in different plants. You take those chemicals, you crush them up, you apply them as an organic herbicide, and you may or may not be applying a concentrated dose. Synthetic, on the other hand, is guaranteed, and you know exactly what is in it and what is not in it. But because it comes from a lab and because we recommend general safety practices, a lot of people are hesitant to use the synthetic and in general would prefer the organic. And many times, if something's organically derived, it is naturally gonna be less concentrated than a synthetic material. The synthetic material can be many times more concentrated than nature provides a lot of the times, and in doing so increases the chances of harm. So yes, I recommend going with the organic route when possible, but keep in the back of your mind that the organic is still a chemical, still an herbicide, and needs to be treated just as carefully as the synthetic chemicals. Now it's important to recognize that all four of these categories are either or, and any herbicide is going to exist with all four of these categories. So you can have a post-emergent contact broad spectrum organic herbicide, and a horticultural vinegar would be a good example of that. Uh, you could have a pre-emergent systemic selective synthetic for example. So any herbicide will have these characteristics and they'll be on one side or the other of this divide. Pre-emergent herbicides prevent germination. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side that image of uh, what is a farm and all of the grass is growing between the rows of the vegetables. And uh, that's a case where a pre-emergent may become beneficial. Or even in a turf grass setting, the fields on a professional sports field, you want to keep the broadleaf weeds out, you can apply a pre-emergent so that the existing plants can grow just fine, but only new seed introductions do not grow. A pre-emergent prevents germination. It may persist in the environment and it may damage young or recently transplanted plants. So we wanna apply pre-emergent with caution. And many people will apply a pre-emergent and assume that it's safe because you're not really killing any plants that are out there. But it's important to remember that a pre-emergent is still an herbicide and still needs to be applied with all the proper safety precautions. And with post-emergence, now we've got contact herbicides. These are chemicals that touch the leaves and stems of actively growing weeds. In this case, the coverage is important. You wanna make sure you have enough coverage to control the plant. And these are often effective against annual broad leaves. This is in contrast to systemic herbicides. In this case, the herbicide, the chemical is translocated or goes through the vascular system of the plant 
through the growing stems and roots. And oftentimes this is the preferred herbicide for perennial weeds, those that will persist year after year. In this case, timing and the growth cycle are important. You want to apply the chemical at the time of the year when it is going to send the majority of the herbicide to the proper place. And plants go dormant in the winter, and so they'll either be storing carbohydrates or they'll be burning the stored carbohydrates. And we want to try to apply herbicide to a plant when it is transmitting the chemicals in the proper direction. The image down below shows the effectiveness of systemic herbicides. In this case, we have a soybean plant that was given one drop of the herbicide 2,4-D. And you can see the wilting and the dying that is occurring. And that is compared on the right-hand side to a soybean plant that was uh, applied with a contact herbicide and rebounded and recovered. You can only see one or two little curled up dead leaves down below. And so you may say, uh-oh, the systemic is so toxic that it kills that plant. And yes, that's the point when you're applying herbicides. And uh, what's better, spraying a whole bunch all over the surface or taking a dropper and applying one drop? I'm not arguing in favor of one or the other here, but just pay attention to what exactly we're talking about. And it's important for us to really understand what's going on. Selective or non-selective herbicides. Non-selective herbicides are those that go after any kind of growing plant. An example would be glyphosate, which is very popularly used. Soil fumigants would be other types of non-selective herbicides. This is in contrast to selective herbicides that will only go after grasses or those that will only go after broad leaves. The benefit with the selective is not only do you reduce the chance that you will target something that you're not intending to kill, but you can apply these chemicals in the middle of growing plants and you'll have proper herbicide control without damaging the desired plant. Now we have natural and organic herbicides. Uh, we have the contact non-selective natural and organic herbicides. In this case, we have examples of horticultural vinegar which is a 20% solution of acetic acid. Uh, be very careful with horticultural vinegar. It's very strong and it can hurt you and burn you. Uh, this is not the same vinegar you put on your salad. That's uh, less than 5% uh, acetic acid. Uh, citric acid, there's some products, orange oil, other things that you can get out there, botanical oils, a lot of people use neem oil on any, anything and everything. And you want to similarly be just as careful applying these organic herbicides as you are when you apply synthetic herbicides. Corn gluten meal is a common pre-emergence. It's put down to prevent weed seeds from germinating. And some of these, you end up with... Uh, remedies, kind of herbal remedies, or people's recommendations that are not scientific, not well tested. So I recommend you use caution when applying any of these sorts of things that you hear about secondhand and someone says it works. Be very careful. And this includes the Blue Dawn dish soap and all the other things that are out there as kind of these home remedies for taking care of pests and weeds. Um, you have the potential to do harm when you're applying any chemical, regardless of whether it is natural, organic, or synthetic. We'll talk a little bit about safe use and handling here. If you are using herbicides or if you're supervising someone else, it's very important that they do the right thing and don't do the wrong thing. Um, if you're getting paid and you're applying herbicides, you need to be licensed or you need to be supervised by someone who is licensed. If you're a homeowner, 
Uh, they let you poison yourself in your own home, uh, but you still want to do things properly. So you need to follow the label and the instructions carefully. In particular, you need to agree and follow with the concentration and the application. Don't put twice as much. And if you need to dilute it, dilute it properly. You need to wear all the proper personal protective equipment. And some pesticides might even require you to cover up coveralls, chemical resistant suits, footwear, aprons, headgear, protective eyewear, respirators. If it's required in the safety data sheet and if it's required according to the Department of Pesticide Regulation, you got to wear it. It's for your own benefit. A lot of people don't want to do it because it looks bad in the environment to be dressed up in a chemical suit. Well, if that's the case, maybe find ways to not need to apply the chemical. You need to avoid injuring non-target species. You need to apply in a precise way at the right time of day. Don't let it spray in the wind. Don't get it in the storm drains. You need to be applying this properly. How do you know what to do? Well, you need to get yourself certified. Go get a QAL or a QAC, a Qualified Applicator's License or Certificate. We want to minimize risk to the groundwater, and we need to know how to clean up our equipment after use. Not only labeling the equipment properly so somebody doesn't come and drink water out of it later, but also so that you know how to clean your clothing, the equipment properly so that we avoid any future contamination. And up there, I have a few images. One is uh, the three types of signal word that you can find on any chemical. Danger, warning, caution. It goes, danger is the worst, warning is the medium, and caution is the least harmful. So if you're selecting chemicals and you know nothing else, Try to avoid the danger and try and stick with the caution. You'll be better off. And then the sign on the right-hand side is a requirement. You need to post if you're going to apply pesticides as a professional, and you want to prevent people from entering the landscape for 24 hours afterwards. And finally, there's herbicide resistance. This is why we want to limit the use of herbicides beyond their other potential harmful impacts. Over time, if we use chemicals to kill plants repeatedly, what we end up doing is killing those that are susceptible to the chemical, and all the future weeds that come back are going to be those that have a resistance to it. We will actually be selecting or you know, speeding up the evolution and the adaptations of these weeds to make our own chemicals less effective. So herbicide resistance is problematic for a number of reasons, but if herbicides are going to remain a tool that we use in very limited contexts, there may be times when it is the least harmful method, believe it or not, but it only is effective if it works. And so we want to not encourage herbicide resistance. How do we do that? We only apply herbicides when absolutely necessary. That's why this is the top of the pyramid. And we try and use the other methods first. If so, we still need to use herbicides. It's a good idea to rotate chemicals, not just active ingredients or the name of the chemical. Rotate the mode of action by which the chemical kills the plant. And when you do that, you will. Uh, limit your selectivity, your selective pressure on these weed species. Um, we want to maximize our reliance on non-chemical methods. So it's not like you have to pick one or the other. Try all the other type of methods, reduce the weeds that way, and then you only need to apply a much smaller amount of chemical if and when you do. And Tolerance finally can be useful in an agricultural setting when we get toward the conventional agriculture and these types of conditions where you have what's known as Roundup Ready crops, uh, where certain crops are tolerant of the herbicide and others are not. 
Well, that was something that was selected for an intended purpose so that you could apply the herbicide, kill all the weeds, and leave the desired crop. And uh, you may have a, uh, an opinion on whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for the environment or for people, but one way or another, it's an important part of our culture and our world today. And it's important to understand how herbicide resistance is used and why in general we want to avoid encouraging it. So there we go with a very thorough introduction of several weed control strategies, how to think when you're approaching uh, weed problems, always focus on prevention and then focus on least invasive methods. Uh, mechanical removal is often a great idea and the chemicals are the last resort. And we only want to use them if it's absolutely necessary to prevent a greater harm of allowing the weeds to exist. And when those chemicals are used, either by you or others, they need to be done so properly, safely, and in a smart, strategic way, so we don't encourage just the wide, broad spread application of harmful and hurtful chemicals in our environment and in our bodies. I hope you enjoyed learning about this topic and uh, rounding out our discussion of weeds in the landscape. And now as you approach your own landscapes in the future, you have a lot of tools with you to be able to identify, prevent, design landscapes so that you have minimal weeds moving into the future and then there's less need to do costly maintenance.